so welcome everyone. Uh, my name's Keith. Uh, some of you may know me as uh, Alagala. I've been working in open source for a couple of years now, so not very long in relative uh, time compared to a lot of you folks, but uh, mainly been focused on open daylight. Um, the reason why that moniker is uh, I had a lot of problems logging into websites and selecting K Burns and then K Burns and then my birth date. And I just got sick of it, so I picked the name of the street I grew up on in Australia, which you can tell by the accent. So you're probably thinking, oh, no, no good on Burns. You've gone and uh, given away one of your secret passwords to your bank account. What is the street you grew up on? No, I'm not that stupid. Yeah, whenever I get that question, I give the street my brother grew up on, just to make sure there's no confusion whatsoever. So uh, that's sometimes why you'll see Alaglar at Gmail on some of the BPP dev lists. But my background really has been in open daylight. Um, before I give you a little bit more of my background so you understand the context through which I'll be presenting uh, with others over the next couple of days, very important to introduce a few folks. First of all, um, yes, yes, you can stop playing now. Dave Barrick, uh, please, Dave. You know, it's actually worth standing up. Yeah, no, seriously, dude, stand up. Well, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. Well, thanks a lot, guys. So, I, I, please, Dave, I, speaking yeah. of the mic, you mic'd up, correct? Well, I'm, I mic'd up. So, yeah, at any rate, I'm Dave Barrick, and I want to, you know, reiterate what Keith has said and what Emron said, which is to thank you guys all for coming and participating in this. This has been, uh, the, the vector work has been the bulk of my uh, working career at Cisco. I've been at it a dozen years or so, and... You know, for the longest time, I felt like Sisyphus rolling the hill up the rock, only to have it roll back over me. Now, the scariest part is to see a room full of people like this, where I realize the rock's gone over the top, dude. Hope it doesn't hit your house. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I, th I think the community has a great chance to do some cool stuff. We're already seeing a bunch of contributions from, uh, you know, folks that I haven't directly talked to particularly. And, you know, it's the neatest thing in the world to see, you know, kind of your child um, grow up, go away to college. Now, the hope is they won't come back with a tattoo, you know, stupid here and a bunch of body piercings you could have done without. But at any rate, guys, thanks a lot. Um, I'm, a, I'm around. I'm here to, um, you know, make sure that somebody has Keith's back and really to take the blame for anything that's effed up in the sources because, as they say, you know, you guys have read the code now and I decided to wear exactly the same shirt so you'd be sure to shoot the right guy. Thanks a lot, everybody, and welcome. Thanks. And so, uh, Damien, you just want to quickly just say hi. This is Damien Marin. Okay. Ah, good. So I'm Damien. I'm um, working on VPP last two years. Uh, before that, I have a long, long networking background. So uh, I'm CCIE, double CCIE for ten years. I'm uh, doing a lot of projects with different service providers, and I've been much more in the in the networking area, but two years ago I started working with VPP and moved to the to the software development. So I'm now working with, uh, with Dave and other guys uh, on, on VPP. So, yeah, a lot of change for me in the last two years, and uh, actually in the in those last two years I, I was in the same position like you are today. So I started learning and uh, doing stuff on VPP, and I realized very, very sh quickly that it's really cool stuff. You can do a lot of networking stuff high-performing networking stuff on the on the computers, and uh, I really start liking it. Thanks, mate. Thank you. And I know Ed's not paying attention, but our TSC chair over there, Ed Warnicke. And so, you no know, need to go say a few words unless you want to. I think most people know you, have a chance and a break. But I pretty much just introduced folks by the most amount of contributions they've made to the code base, and I don't fall onto that list. So, my background, uh, I started out doing mainframe systems programming as soon as I got out of high school. Um, I was over in Japan doing a bit of robotic stuff, and a whole bunch of friends I used to work with in the steelworks then went to this weird company called Cisco, and they were having a hell of a time. So when I got back, I joined. I was in the TAC, uh, was CCI Proctor for a bit, uh, worked in IT for a bit for APAC, then went into sales doing MPLS and optical, uh, met the love of my life, quit Cisco, came over here because she's American, Worked at a few telcos as a principal architect in Colorado. Got back into Cisco in sales of all things. That didn't work out too well. Um, not really my speed. More power to you if it is. And then got into something completely different. Ended up doing equity trading of all things. And got back into programming in order to scale. Had these ideas, wanted to put them in the code. And realized that 
I like solvable problems of which the stock market is not one. Just Google heteroschedatic returns and you'll read and go, aha, yeah, that kind of sucks. Unsolvable problems. I like solvable problems. So I got back into coding there, going to open source and worked on Open Daylight on the OVSDB project in hydrogen. Uh, I'm the project technical lead for group-based policy, which has been around since Helium. So that's what our now third release and uh, also committed on service function chaining and a couple of other things as well. And recently got into VPP. Um, so why did I get asked to you know, be upfront and do a bit of the talking? Well, I felt perhaps some of the pain that you might have felt when you get into a new project, like any new project. You have people who understand the huge source code base, there's 230,000 lines of code. Which bit's important? Well, they're all important or they wouldn't be there. Well, what I'm gonna try and do over the next few days is give you my kind of view on the things that I thought were important. And maybe they're not important to you, and that's okay. So what I'd really ask you to do is we're here for you to get benefit. You know, it's not so much that we need to punch through a checklist of content and that call out a victory at the end of three days and pat ourselves on the back. You know, that doesn't do anyone any service if you don't understand the system better. So I'd rather, rather than check the box on 10 things, we check the box on three and you walk away going, yeah, I've really learned those three things. And now I can go learn four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, via the mailing list, the wiki, but we build a really strong base. So that's some of the goals. And we'll go through those in a little bit. Now, I generally eschew the whole, you know, show of hands who's a Gemini, show of hands who's a Sagittarius, and breaking the ice crap like that. But this bit is important. Show of hands who, is, who has got either the Vagrant VM set up in any way, shape, or form, or has a running VPP instance on their laptop. Quick show of hands. Okay, and more easier one, who does not? I didn't want to embarrass anyone. Does anyone not have that environment? Okay, and you have a technical issue, I believe. It was it you that was having the problems? And you, you can get help over there at the help desk. I forgot to mention that before. And who else does not? Okay, and so, and if you intend to, this is how you get the code. Okay, cool. So it seems by and large everyone has, and so I thought we'd start with this because it can take some time. Dave and I tested the Wi-Fi this morning, did a speed test, and I was blown away. A bit weird asymmetry, 100 meg down, 200 meg up. Go figure, that's handy. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can do whatever you throw, whatever you want out there. You know, engineering documents, blueprints, throw that stuff on the internet, but don't drag down any porn, for God's sakes. Um, and Dave goes, well, not so fast, Burns, let's run it together. <laughs> and so we ran it together and it went down. So your mileage will vary on the download speed. So I'm really glad to hear everyone does have at least the Vagrant environment up. So that's probably the first most important point. And you've already made your decisions, congratulations. Uh, I'll be using Ubuntu, um, and Emacs, they're just the two things that I use. So uh, we do have people that use a wide variety of things. You know, Dave uses Emacs, Damian uses Vi. Uh, we probably have a couple of people who use CentOS as well. So whichever camp you fall into in terms of your favorite editor, in terms of your favorite operating system, we'll got you covered. So definitely no bias in terms of the, uh, the content. So I tried to break down some goals. We could talk about agenda, but that's cute. But let's talk about some real goals. So, the first thing is to learn the VPP code structure. Um, I found this to be really interesting. I, I had this thing where I think about things in terms of complexity versus complication. And you know, there's lots of different definitions out there for it. The one that really hits home to me is a description, I believe it's on one of the IBM wikis, about your complex systems are made up of lots of relatively simple components that build up into something complex. Where complicated systems have fewer components but are more opaque, your black box type systems. And so I naturally tend to favor things that are just complex. You know, I, as long as I can understand the in individual components, I can go, okay, I know what that thing's doing. I can kind of get what it's gonna do when these two relatively simple components talk and you build up and you get emergent behaviors and all that kind of thing. I really like complex systems. Complicated systems, not so much. I describe VPP very much, <clears throat> excuse me, as a complicated, uh, complex system. And when we go and break down the code structure, you'll see there's some really well thought out, some actually at times very, very clever, if you're into the geeky bit manipulation stuff, functions that are in the guts of VPP that are very tiny and simple, but when you actually compose these things up into bigger things, you get this really cool emergent behavior. 
And as it turns out, when you do things like that, you actually get something that's very extensible as well and cohesive and is part of the you know, Unix you know, tenements of you know, do one thing very well and all that kind of good stuff. The next thing we're going to go through after that, and by the way, this, this afternoon, I pretty much thought most people might be very gooding up, so we've kept it at kind of the uh, interpretive dance type level of presentation. But as of tomorrow, we're going to be really going through a debugger together. So I've got some stuff, that uh, some scripts that I'll show later on, uh, some URLs you can download, and we'll ha you'll have all the uh, GDB define commands that I knocked up over the weekend that dump the state of the graph. Uh, some of the breakpoints that are all set by uh, symbol, not line, so you know they should be pretty invariant, right? Depending on what Git repo you pull down, that kind of thing. But the idea is we'll walk through that together, and we'll actually show you what's going on in the different uh, data structures and as the graph gets constructed. So we'll go through you know, VPP, the initialization sequence, and the graph wiring. So when you understand how that stuff works. Then we'll actually look at how to actually take a, a graph node. And the, we're going to use the same example if you're familiar with the pre-launch videos of MaxSwap. Now, it doesn't sound like the sexiest thing out there. And there's a good reason. It's not, because we're not really interested initially in a really cool, sexy algorithm uh, inside our graph node. We just want something basic so you know what the fundamental principles are that go into a graph node, a structure that we know works right? in terms of sitting on top of all these composable libraries. So we'll go through that, and we'll all do that together. And then there's some extra things that we need to do, right? So we have a CLI and API, uh, CLI and API and the tracing tools. So there is a debug CLI. If you're familiar with VPP, you've probably seen it. it. It has grown out of development tool. By and large, though, we want to use the binary APIs. We'll go through how do you generate your CLI and binary APIs for your particular graph node. Then Dave is going to talk, and I did forget that I didn't actually put in here the exact agenda item, like things like event logger. Actually, I really should mention that. Uh, when I go through some of the, I'm going to go over a bit of an overview of what vector processing versus scalar processing is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about cycle times. And it's going to be the very kind of arm waving level. Dave actually has a tool that counts to the nanosecond what's going on in the graph nodes. Like it's literally measured in nanoseconds. Sure, you can measure a day in nanoseconds, but this is sub-millisecond timing he can get to and show you, and you can go through it. And we're going to cover that tomorrow. So we're going to go into quite a bit more of detail about how all this stuff works. So I didn't mention that on there. It's the event logger. It sounds like syslogging, but it's nothing like syslogging. This is really cool stuff. And then the buffer metadata, Dave's got a really cool presentation on that. And so I think once we learn about the different libraries, deconstruct the code, build our graph node, build an API, learn a little bit about the uh, timing of how vectors work. I think about that time, it's going to be really helpful to understand what is really in the buffer metadata. Um, from there, then Damian is going to cover multi-coring and, uh, and threading. And uh, Christian from Intel, who's uh, Christian, do you just want to throw your hand up? He's going to be presenting an intro to DPDK this afternoon, but also a bit of a deeper dive with Damian on uh, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, and from there, we're just going to cover some of the other key features, a bit of a code walkthrough, right? There's a pre-existing stuff like the classifier. Now, the classifier is one of my favorite bits of VPP. It's incredibly powerful and incredibly flexible. Like, I have done a bucket load of networking stuff, and when you see something like this that doesn't just go classifier, F it, I'll just do an ACL, right? It's nothing like that. This is so powerful, we can use it for so much stuff, and you can tell like it's one of the bits that really gets me excited. Um, we have some other things that people have done uh, with VPP that they're going to be showing on Thursday morning. There's going to be some Lisp. Uh, I know uh, Pierre's going to be talking about some work he's done with MAP46 and SWIT. And that was a, that's a really cool story where he had a, an IETF draft that he wanted to get done, went through all the normal channels, and you know, just, I'll just make some code and show people what I want to do rather than try and put it into words. It's really, really cool and the Open Hackathon. I know Dave's got some very specific ideas. So in order to meet these goals, you know, GDB uh, is table stakes, C-scope. I already mentioned I'll be doing a Vagrant VM uh, with VirtualBox and Ubuntu and Emacs. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. What I will be doing to make it a bit easier on folks is as we do a piece of content, like the slides, I'll take those, convert them to PDF, and put them up on the wiki. So if you want to refer back to the previous session, you know, 
modulo amount of time it takes me to print to PDF and put up there, they'll be there, right? Um, so you'll have access to all the stuff and all the links. So you know, hopefully that's a useful reference as we go through. If we've covered something, you wanna go back, it'll be there. Cool? How are we doing so far? Is this the right kind of level of thing that you're expecting? Because uh, I haven't gone into way detail yet about uh, some of the things we'll be covering. But the graph initialization sequence, does that sound how the graph's actually wired together? Useful? Breaking down the core functions, you know, what vectors are, the two sorts of vectors as I like to call them. All right. And then uh, rather than deep diving, you know, we'll go through a fairly simple example together, answer any questions you have, and then look at some, how some very cool specific features have been coded. Sound reasonable so far? Okay, so what is glaringly obvious from here, and I'll just call it out, uh, things like hardware offload, I haven't covered it because it's not something I've really been digging into personally, but we have people who do know it. If that's something you want to dig into, just let us know. Grab any of the people here you know, from FIDO and just let us know during a break and we'll see what we can do about accommodating it. If there's anything that doesn't look like we're going to cover that you came here to learn, please let us know. Like, there's so much stuff we could cover. As I said, there's like 230 odd thousand lines of code. I certainly don't know it all, <laughs> not even a small fraction. So, but please make sure your questions get answered. It's very important. Probably, uh, probably the earlier, um, you know, the earlier in the sequence folks say, you know, look, I don't see X. Can we please do something about X? The earlier you, you, you bring it up, probably the easier it is to accommodate because if it's if it's Thursday afternoon and everybody's headed for the everybody's headed for the watering hole we're screwed yeah we're failed <laughs> yeah yeah well and the other the other thing is I have a good supply of cards um, folks are always welcome to email um, I prefer not doing um, you know the same question a thousand times so you know again leverage you know leverage the mailing list but you know we're, we're here to help at this point in the game I mean my you know my uh, rolling the rock up the hill has been, you know, has been done over the last dozen years, and really, I want to enable other people to be able to go forward in the way that they, uh, they wish with the source base. I don't have much of an agenda about where we take the stuff, so. Yeah, Dave can pretty much dive into anything, so. Wow. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I have the the flat head to prove I hit the bottom <laughs> of the pool once in a while too. So, <laughs> this is uh, I'm, I've taken a bit of poetic license. Um, in describing vector versus scalar processing. But I'll disabuse any of the poetic license bits over the next couple of days, and we'll get into some really succinct detail. But I just want to, by and large, this is a useful way of kind of describing the differences. And I've got to make sure I explain as well how we achieve such stable cycle times, which is a really key point. Now, this is just a kind of decision tree I splattered down. It's not meant to represent any particular implementation. It's certainly not VPP's implementation. It's not meant to be the kernel or a Cisco router. It's just generally how might one process an IP packet, right? So you have a bunch of decisions you want to make. So as part of a decision and then processing that decision on a packet that is not showing up very nicely in the colors, that Ethernet's meant to be green and the IP header's meant to be blue. It looks very green on my screen you would do some kind of processing, hence green, right? I was trying to make the colors match. So you'd have some processing you want to do. On the ethernet bits, you'd have some code for ethernet input and then outputting it on ethernet. And then you'd have a bunch of you know, IP handling things, like what sort of IP4 input was it? Uh, if it's this sort of thing locally, do I need to do a lookup? And then some kind of rewrite. So you got some code that, so to, to make these decisions and do processing. So we have a bunch of things which are the processing to be done to a bunch of things over there. So there's the processing and the thing that's going to be processed. And so the poetic license bit is Ethernet IP because you know it's a little bit more complex than that, but it's simple enough. So in terms of an apologies to the really serious hardware CPU type folks, I'm taking a very simplistic view. But the basic idea is, and the game that we're playing here is efficiency at the caching level, one of the major games. And we'll go into a few more tomorrow morning, but the key one is cache efficiency. So instruction cache versus data cache. And every time you have to go to main memory, that's incredibly expensive. You want to avoid that. So in scalar processing, essentially, you're going to read in some kind of packet, ouch, right, into the data cache. And then you're going to pull in some instructions to process on that particular piece of memory. And that's an ouch as well. And so by and large, once that bit's done, it pulls in the next bunch of instructions, and so on and so forth each time incurring an ouch. 
and so on and so forth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. With vector processing, same packets, same code, but instead, this time, you incur an ouch, but this time we're actually going to pull in a vector of things and operate on a vector of things for this piece of code. So we incur the iCache ouch, but then we only incur the Ethernet cache ouch once. Then we incur the IP instruction cache ouch, and then we pull in all the IP packets that we want to process. But then we switch out to a different bit of processing. We don't have to change this so on and so forth. Now, why is that important? Well, let's talk about cycle times. So let's go back and have a quick look at here. So this ouch that gets pulled in. So when I do pull in the bit of code for Ethernet input, right, that's a finite amount of time, right? But when we look at, if you, especially if you've done any, there's a really cool book on um, uh, feedback control in computer systems by O'Reilly. I think it's Jan Janet, J-A-N-E-R-T is the author's last name. By and large, when you look at how to solve control uh, or feedback control loop problems, a lot of the times this, when you think about duty cycles, this out you could think about as the down duty cycle. And then the amount of time spent in here is the up duty cycle. And both those two things are finite, right? So you've got a, a finite amount of downtime, a finite amount of uptime. And then if you have too much things coming in, right, you get a backlog. And a lot of these feedback control loops focus on how can I throttle the input, right? But with vector processing, we don't do that. Because essentially, this is a fixed cost. But if my vector size grows, right, because I have a burst of traffic come in while I'm processing a particular vector, and the vector size grows, well then, if this thing grows, this thing doesn't switch out. And so instead of having a, a fixed on-off duty cycle, it has a fixed off-duty cycle in terms of the out you're pulling it into iCache. But the amount of time it spends in here is directly related to how many things there are to process. So the amount of productivity it gets done is much higher. And so what happens is, and you often hear us talk about amortizing this cost or this ouch cost across the size of the vector, Right? Because when you spend more time doing good things, because this will stay in here doing good things while that thing is still there to be processed, you're more productive. Signal to noise ratio, pick whatever analogy you want. But this fixed cost of bad versus the variable cost of good, varying by the length of your vector, turns out to work in your favor. The more things that stack up, the more time you spend doing good things. You have a fixed number of things you have to do, a fixed number of ouches, and the variable bit is all good. So very quickly you get through that vector and your vector size starts to shrink to a steady state. So in that case, in, in, it, that's where it differs from normal control feedback systems, right? In terms of being able to, we're throttling the input. We don't throttle the input because the more input we get, the more time we spend doing productive things and the, the, the queue tends to shrink itself, okay? And Dave has some very explicit pictures of that tomorrow. Reasonable explanation, Dave? Oh. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely a reasonable explanation. I mean, the, you know, the behavior is that um, if you think of it just purely in iCash terms, which may or may not be the, the right way to, to think of it, you say the cost of running you know, the dispatch function for a graph node is X, and it's just simply amortized over the number of packets because almost all the time is spent hauling the stuff in from the memory hierarchy, filling, filling the uh, L0 iCache. And the idea is, as the vector size grows, the, the, you know, the cost per packet decreases. So you see, if you perturb the computation um, you know, by uh, having something eat the load store unit, whatever, whatever it is, um, the vector size will increase, but each packet's processed a little bit more efficiently, so the vector size converges back to an equ equilibrium value. I have actually a pretty good, as Keith was saying, I have a pretty good data set to show that um, you know, tomorrow in the context of the event logger. But, uh, you know, it's sort of like an ideal worker when, you know, when there's not much work to do, uh, you know, the, the dispatch functions in the limit end up being scalar processing. I mean, n equals 1 absolutely works. It's more interesting when n equals 100 because you're getting all of the amortization effects. One thing Keith hasn't particularly gone into, which I may be stealing his thunder slightly about, is the idea, okay, now I have five packets in my hands. Well, what can I, do? What can I how can I leverage that situation with getting better processing efficiency? And the, the story is, we haven't said too much about actually walking tables yet. Well, when you get around to walking tables,
You say, oh, I'm going to do a read here, and on a big enough table, I know that read is going to stall. The SDRAM latency is, uh, you know, what, 150 clocks. Let's just pick a round number. Now, what can, I, what can I do to not just stop the bus for 150 clocks? And the answer is, well, rather than actually reading a cell out of a, out of a big table, you prefetch it and move on to the next packet. If you only are doing one packet at a time, you have no, no latitude to make those kinds of decisions. But if you have 100 in hand, you know, walking forward uh, through a pipeline, uh, which you can code uh, pretty pretty trivially with some of the uh, some of the header files we have is easy to do. Um, so th those are the, the sort of the two things. And you, you might say, well, you know, you're painting this picture of Nirvana where the vector size can get to be plus infinity. Well, at some point you run out of SDRAM bandwidth. One of the other things you run out of are available load store slots. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, outstanding prefetches before the, uh, you know, before the train comes to a halt, before the first one pops out of there. So those are all things to consider uh, in vectorization. And a lot of the stuff is, you know, similar to simulated annealing, if you guys know that optimization algorithm. It's a little bit of a black art. And after a while, you get a pretty good feel of, oh, if I code this a particular way, it's going to really scream. If I don't code it that particular way, you know, your mileage may vary. You don't just want to say, oh, prefetches are good and throw in all the prefetches right. you can find. No, and I cover a little bit of that tomorrow morning in terms of um, self-similar traffic and how we leverage that. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, there you go. VPP does prefetching into dcache. <laughs> and all this will become clear. But that's good, right? So better understanding now, because I know that was one of the questions I've been asked a couple of times. I know Dave probably gets asked it as well, is that's great, you can vary the vector size. How has it reached this steady state? It's not a fixed duty cycle. It's variable, and the variable bit's really productive. Does that make a little bit more sense? No nods, no winks, no shakes of the head? Yeah. Okay. One of the challenges is actually since you know, when running at a reasonable rate, the thing sits and run, you know, just runs as hard as it can, you know, how do you say, okay, well, how loaded am I? And the vector size, after a while, you begin to realize is not a bad metric for that. I've had, over the last decade, I've had huge problems explaining to a customer why, well, the, C the CPU utilization is always one, but yet sometimes it, you know, it'll, it'll drop packets, but only after we apply so much traffic. Now, what, you know, what metric can we, can we put up? And I just generally say the vector size is a pretty good, albeit extraordinarily nonlinear metric. Mm -hmm. It's actually not as nonlinear as you'd think. In the beginning of time, up to a few hundred thousand packets a second, the answer is going to be one, because that's about all it can do. Or you'll be running in interrupt mode, a, a, you know, a, a topic we want to roll back in as we get to um, the latest DPDK, which will support us in, the, in that endeavor. Then you get a fairly nice linear region up to a, up to a vector size of between 100 and 130, where as you, as, you know, as you apply load, you could do a regression and get, the, you know, get a decent curve fit. And then all of a sudden, it really runs out of something, and it hits a very sharp uh, knee in the curve from 150 to, uh, you, know, you know, game over rover is not a tremendous amount of additional applied load. You run out of clock cycles, you run out of load store bandwidth, you run out of uh, prefetch opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. So graph nodes, uh, Emron kind of gave us a bit of an overview. Here's a kind of, these are actually real um, VPP nodes. So when we get to showing the VLib graph, these should look familiar. Uh, we, the key thing is that these, this graph is composed at runtime. So some, one of the questions I was asked is, well, can you show me the config file about how I wire all the graph nodes together? It's not done at config time. It's actually done at runtime. Now, why is that important? Well, there's two schemes. They both leverage the same mechanics underneath, but there's two schemes. There's the uh, compiled in the VNet graph nodes, and then there's plugins. And the question often comes, well, which one's more important? You know, what are the real differences? Well, when it comes to the graph construction at runtime, there is no difference. And we'll go through and prove that to you tomorrow, step by step. There are different stages. Obviously, we know about the, the compiled graph nodes ahead of time, the ones that are actually within the linked in the v, VNet compile. We know about those at runtime. Their uh, constructors are already called. But we then go and look and pull in all the plugins. And then we have a list of all the nodes. Then we go construct the graph. So it's not like plugins are second class citizens. They're both exactly the same. They use exactly the same mechanisms. It's just when do they actually get pulled into the linked list to be processed. And we'll go through that in excruciating ad nauseum detail tomorrow just to make sure everyone understands. And none of this is, let's configure this in a text file, and this is what it's going to look like. It's all done 
uh, at runtime, which has some pretty cool benefits, right? Mm -hmm. Means that we can modify the graph post runtime, right? We have the tools, you can use the mechanisms, go for it. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, there's nothing to say about, um, uh, you, there's no difficulty spinning up um, nodes and arcs in the graph, really any old time. Yeah. Deleting, deleting arcs, deleting nodes, not so much, but spinning them up, you can, you know, 10 minutes after the thing starts, if you feel like spinning up a node, yeah. uh, go for it. And there's even potentially a case where we could swap nodes out um, just in the, in the runtime list. So that's essentially it. So in terms of features, and you're going to see a common theme in red come up. So you all can read. I've tried to make this as representative possible. There's a bucket load of stuff that it does. But the key thing to me is it does counters for everything. Everything is counted. We're going to cover that tomorrow as well in our graph node. But everything is counted as it happens. So how do you do that? Well, you, you, you want to stay on because this is near and well, dear to you. But the counters are just so important. Instrumentation. Yeah, this is, it's, it's also the case that in a multi-threaded environment, you have to be pretty delicate yeah. about it because you end up, if you just say, OK, it's perfectly correct to do atomic ads all over the place. No contest it really is. The problem being, you're going to find um, the, you know, it's really a serious performance hit to do that. So what we tend to do with counters that are often hit from multiple worker threads is we have a, you know, 60, you know, for, for any given thing, there's a 64-bit, here's absolutely truth, and here are 16-bit counters that are bumped non-atomically by each of the threads, and then there's an, oh my God, now I need to do an atomic scrape to get my particular counter back into the, back into the, uh, six, you know, into the 64-bit counter. For, for pack accounts, for example, you get a you know, one in 65,000 atomic operate, which is really seriously helpful in terms of not um, you know, stalling the memory subsystem. That you know, in an NPU, you tend to have very special purpose hardware. You say, bump this counter. I don't want to know what the answer is now. Somebody will scrape it later. Well, to do a similar-ish kind of thing with commodity hardware, you have to be a little clever because you know, yes, the x86, 64, yes, the ARM chips have uh, perfectly usable atomic ops, but they don't perform like special purpose hardware in an NPU does. So you have to, you know, you have to, you know, render unto Caesar what Caesar's and do it the right way. Right. So it's kind of a cute thing. Well, yeah, and actually it goes a bit beyond cute because they're not sampled counters, right? Yeah. Even though the atomicity is done in a very clever no. way so we don't kill the system, you speak to guys like uh, Dave Meyer at Brocade, who's very passionate about machine learning. And he said, you know, there's a lot of really sophisticated machine learning algorithms, but there's some really simpler, well-known ones when applied to networking would be really cool. What are we missing? Streaming decent instrumentation. Well, it's right yeah. here. Right? Per packet, per everything you do counters are right here. So we have the granularity of data there, and I think this is something that's been missing in a lot of places, right? It's no summarization of counters, no summarization of information. If you want the granularity, it's all here. And that's why I highlighted quite a bit because yeah. I think machine learning is cool. Yeah, one, one thing we, you know, really as a community want to think about is, look, the counters aren't bad. But, you know, each count, uh, you know, everybody took calculus in school. So, you know, you believe the epsilons mm -hmm. and deltas adds up. And one of the things that we've been pretty cavalier about are adding per node counters for every event known to mankind. Like, I just ate a packet. Well, is that actually interesting? In yeah. some node, in some cases it is, in some it isn't. And you might want to, you know, we might want to go have a weeding the garden exercise to clean some of them out. The ones that are, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, fine, you got a packet, but everybody, but it's easy enough to infer you got a packet by what else is going on. Do you really need to count all of the, you know, yep, I ate, you know, yep, I ate ones? Yeah, you, we don't want to get to the point where the only thing we're measuring is how well we count things. Yeah. So then it would be accounting instead of networking or computer science. <laughs> Was that a dig at me, mate? <laughs> you having a go at me? So in terms of, that's enough on the vector processing. That's, that's a high level overview, right? And that's what we're doing in terms of why we can reach these kind of really cool steady state cycle times and they're adaptive. In terms of the bounce of Tic Tacs, the release plan. So we're going to adopt this nomenclature, I believe that's been ratified, yes? The nomenclature in terms of year, month. Have we agreed on yeah. not the specific yeah, yeah. numbers, but that format? Yeah, yeah, I think so. so. So we're going to follow the year-month format for releases for BPP. I mean, 1606, so therefore this year in June. 
uh, yeah. some of the high level features. This is really cool. So having worked on other open source projects, I'm so sure a lot of you have, each of them have their release policies. You know, this is when we do code freeze for this or API freeze or feature freeze. Yeah. Pretty much F0 is committer adult supervision time, right? So in between F0 and RC0, it's like, well, you know, do you sure you really want to put in this 2,500 line of code patch? Because you, you knew that F0 was going to be April 22nd. Like, come on. Why did you wait till now? What we're trying to do is slow things down. You can incremental change stuff, but look, let's just not stop the massive code dumps because you know committers have to review things very carefully because very soon we reach RC0. And this is when we're starting to look at just bug fixing. Um, still TBD on the level of adult supervision wow. on bug fixing. Like, is it bugs only found in QA? So you want to say something, mate? Um, I guess one thing to say is at the point where we pull a release candidate, we're going to release off of, you know, we're going to pull a branch at that point in the game. So the main line basically reopens. Oh, yeah. Now, it may be a little bit limited in terms of what folks have the brain bandwidth to actually code review at that point in the game. But, you know, I just, uh, you know, intuitively having worked in product shops for more than 35 years now, you know, there's a certain point at which you say, okay, this is basically all of the hard stuff, and now we just want to sort it out, get it so that it's dead, dead nut stable, and then push it out the door. Once the release candidate uh, branch is pulled, if you find something in the main line that, that you know, needs to go one, you know, back and forth, a little bit of double committing action is required. But this is just mechanics to keep, uh, you know, to keep from running around shooting ourselves in the foot with the nearest large caliber weapon and <laughs> making it real hard to release stuff with quality, because the last thing I want um, from the internal customers who are using this within Cisco is I do not want phone calls at two in the morning. They all know they all know my home phone number, my home address, and they have my cell number, so they can make my life totally miserable. So you know this for any number of reasons. Now I don't know where folks in the room are with thinking about what they want, might want to build out of this stuff and ship mm -hmm. as product, but um, assuming that folks intend to do that, you know this is just you know, derived from many years of history to try to make, uh, you know, to make things sane and to not kill the committers off completely when, when we're trying to clean stuff down, you know, calm, yeah. calm uh, shit down. We want to evolve, avoid that old canard of, well, I'll just log a bug in JIRA for my feature. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a bug. No. So it's just trying to make sure things are very stable. But uh, by all means, go have a look. If there's something you want to commit to doing, you know, what is it, April 4th now, we're probably running out of time for major big things, but yeah, yeah. F0 doesn't close till 422. Yeah. Has, this been has this been agreed upon in the VPP meeting? Yeah, I've, I've no heard, dissent? you know, yeah, we've, we've certainly run it up the flagpole and haven't seen too many dead fish, you know, small dead animals, including fish hmm. about it, so. But as Dave said, you know, there's always going to be master, so there'll be a branch and then yeah, there'll yeah. be master for iteration. So in terms of resources, uh, obviously the wiki. So please go there. Uh, always new content being added. Thoroughly, really recommend folks, please start with the wiki. It's the best place to get uh, you know, yeah. uh, advice, ideas, and the key thing for us is if you've gone to the wiki and it ain't there, then we'll just go add it there. That's yeah. the good indication for us if we're getting yeah. lots of questions. One more thing on the wiki is, you know, although I've, I've appreciated the, the times folks have sent corrections, if something's busted, just fix it. I mean, there, mm. there are places where, you know, typos, you know, simple stuff, you know, yeah, thank, you know, thanks everybody for being gentle about it, but just go in and frickin' fix it and maybe send an email afterwards. You know, that, you know, fixing doc bugs is definitely a, you know, forgiveness rather than permission kind of thing from my point of view. Yeah. There's an IRC channel. <laughs> I don't use it very much as, or as much as I should. Yeah. He who prefers IRC over other forms of communication or mainly email, I swore I'd try not to do the polling thing. I don't see anyone yeah. vociferously going, oh, yes, IRC, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. because <laughs> I've, been, I've been really personally remiss about getting on there because, again, the, the problem I have with the, uh, you know, and I, I know we swore an oath not to mumble too much about what goes on inside our own company. But the thing I've noticed inside my own company is that um, I end up jumped on within 30 seconds. And I mean, you know, it's one of, the, one of these where the alligators got you by the leg and you're getting slowly dragged into the river. And I, I you know, I, I'll try, um, especially if somebody pokes me one way or another, says, look, get on the IRC channel and help people. I'm glad to try it. It's not something that I've historically done much. 
I guess I'll, I'll plead guilty on that one. But you're right. Yeah, momentum. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. email, by and large, email is the best. You know, I really wish we could get to Mailman 3 because it's much easier to search the archives than it is with oh. the current Mailman. Peck and choose through. It's like, oh, have you searched the list? I'd love to. How do I do that exactly? I'm going to Laboriously. <laughs> you don't search. You yeah. beat yourself to death. Yeah, so, <laughs> but by and large, I think people, we have been reasonably good at responding to questions on BPP Dev. We'll see what we can do about creating a searchable archive because that would be a lot better. You know, I know everyone would be able to appreciate that. I'd be able to search and not feel like they're asking the same question. But for now, just ask away. Like We really appreciate it.